uh, Torah is water and we're doing Torah now. Uh. So yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking about that too. <laughs> okay, so this is how the seemingly outdated elements of the Torah are evidence of, of its perfection, part two. Yeah, uh, and hopefully this is the last part in terms of like the overarching thing in the series. Uh, and then obviously like there's lots of topics we could take it in different directions later. Quick review, same objectives as last time, just to start the conversation and then show you the uh, my answer to this question about how to deal with the obsolete parts of Torah, which really rely on seven premises. And then we're gonna look at some examples today, superficial level, but not uh, not in depth. And then shout out to Rabbi Chaim Angel, whose terminology I'm using. Okay. We gave a bunch of examples of stuff that seems outdated in Torah or seems like anti our morality. And that's kind of what we're trying to address today. Uh, again, really, really quick review. So we had last time we did four of the seven premises. Number one, the Torah is perfect, cannot be added to or detracted from, and is binding for all time. I'm smiling beneath my mask because several people listen to this year. And I got, I mean, not several people, lots of people listen to this year, but several people ask me the question of like, couldn't someone listen to your share and think that like, like Torah doesn't apply anymore. And I'm like, that's exactly why in premise one, I said, it's very clear Torah is binding for all time. So hopefully that's clear. I just wanted to restate that one more time. Two, Torah was designed with reference to the norm, like the majority uh, cases, not to exceptional cases. Um, that's how the Torah is designed in general. That's how legal systems are designed in general. Three, the Torah is designed to accomplish its goals to the greatest extent in all times, places, and cultures. That's the Swiss army knife analogy that that if you were designing a Torah specifically for one person, it would be tailor-made to be 100% efficient for that person. But the more people you, ex you design the Torah for, the more general you're going to have to make it. And if you want it to last for all generations and all times and all places, then certain parts are going to have to be like the scissors on the Swiss Army knife that are not designed for efficiency, but designed for flexibility and like application in a lot of places. Um, and then the fourth one was the Torah has mechanisms for situational tweaking. And we listed those. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but the Navi can temporarily suspend a mitzvah. Sanhedrin can make a hora asha, a temporary measure. Chazal can um, adapt Torah shibich sav using the methods of Torah shval peh. There's halakha peturim uh, and heterim, exemptions and licenses. And then uh, ways that halakha deals with stuff outside of halakha. And I want to clarify, someone told me that I made a mistake in this year, but I didn't check. When we, we talked about the example of medicine on Shabbos and how like that was based on the fact that people, um, you know, gra ground their own medicine back then. So someone told me that I accidentally, that I called that a hora as sha'a. Um, if I did say that, I did not mean to say that. It's an example, not of a hora as sha'a, which is just a temporary law. It's an example. I think it came about, I think it was a question you asked or something about like, are, when Chazal make these laws, then were they, could they be, you know, mistaken or something like that? Or I forgot exactly your question. So it was an example of how Chazal were only making the laws based on the realities and the knowledge of their times. They couldn't have known that medicine would take such a radically different direction that people don't grind their own medicine anymore. And if they made this halakha now, they probably wouldn't prohibit taking medicine on Shabbos because we don't do tochen on Shabbos, you know, or we don't do tochen during the week when we take medicine, you know. So I just want to clarify that. Okay, so that was a review of last time. Uh, if there are any immediate questions, <laughs> then we can take those, but if not, we've got a lot to do. Okay, first thing I wanted to show you one example, um, which I meant to bring in last time, of this really interesting Wikipedia article that is an analogy to this concept, okay? It's called, uh, the title is Long-Time Nuclear Waste Warning Messages, okay? Long-time nuclear waste warning messages are intended to deter human intrusion at nuclear waste repositories in the far future within or above the order of magnitude of 10,000 years. So in other words, let's say, what's the most famous nuclear disaster, probably? Uh, yeah, Chernobyl, right? Yeah, I mean, that was a big thing, but Chernobyl is when the nuclear plant melted down and, and crazy radiation and stuff. So what they have to do, you can't, no one is going to be able to live or be there for... 10,000 plus years. So the question is, how do you communicate that message in a way that will be understood thousands of years in the future? Okay, <laughs> which is insane. And they say here, there are four levels of message. So the most basic level is something man-made is here. Okay. Second, cautionary information. Something man-made is here and it is dangerous. Third level tells what, why, when, where, who, and how. Fourth level is complex information. So what's the obvious problem of trying to write a message for 10,000 years in the future? Mm -hmm. Right, so first of all, there's the issue of it lasting, right? So that's one consideration. What else though? Let's say you, 
Yeah, how understandable will we? I mean, what what are the chances? How many languages that were spoken ten thousand years ago are spoken now? I think probably like zero, or I have no idea. You know, or the terms that you're using, like will they know what nuclear waste is or nuclear? You know, so how do you do this? And like, if you go on in the in the article, it says that you're you're trying to get the messages to evoke these things, like uh, these uh, feelings. This place is a message and a part of a system of messages. Pay attention to it, or uh, the danger is still present in your time as it was in ours. So you're trying to convey these very basic things to people who you don't know in languages that you won't understand in a context that you won't understand and make it be effective, you know? So obviously Torah has a lot more at its disposal. Like it's not like this basic, but it's analogous to the type of challenges that the Torah is working with of, of making its laws relevant and effective in thousands of years in the future in many, many different societies with completely different value systems. So I thought it was a good analogy for like what the Torah is trying to, like you have to have appreciating the, the, the problem of creating an eternal Torah that works in every case, okay? Okay, so now today we're gonna focus on the last three premises and these all go together much more so than the first ones. So the premises are the Torah works with human nature and not against it. Uh, six is the Torah includes static and evolutionary morality, which we'll explain what that is uh, when we get to it. And then the Torah was designed with planned obsolescence. Again, obsolete means no use, right? Or no function. Uh, so the Torah was designed with planned obsolescence for a significant number of its mitzvahs. Now, the major source I'm going to get the whole idea from is the Rambam on Korbanos, which I assume you've done in the past in some form. Yeah. So just refreshing our memories, what is the Ramam's basic approach to why uh, we, why the Torah includes mitzvahs about korbanos? If anyone remembers. Just to direct um, man's paganistic, like, I guess, tendencies, whatever the, like, the Zarek and Sorcerer Sam? Yes. Okay. That's the Ramam's basic approach is korbanos are there not because they are good in and of themselves, but in order to direct man's, like you said, paganistic tendencies towards Hashem. But then you can say, well, why do you need them at all? Why need Korbanos at all? Okay. Okay, good. So that's the basic idea of the Ramam, but it's probably been a while, or maybe you've never done this. I don't know. Going through the Ramam inside on that. I don't know if you've done this or not. Was the Ramam after his post Way after Korbanos, yeah. Uh, base of Mikdash was the second base of Mikdash was destroyed in the year 70 CE, and Ram was in the uh, 13th century CE, so like uh, about 1200 years after. And there was no like paganistic thing that came in the Ramam's time? Um, in the, by the Ramam's time, Christianity and Islam were the dominant religions. Uh, there was still paganism like in the same places that there are today, like in, you know, in, in India and like other, you know, uh, in Japan, other tribes, but. Um, but the, but monotheism was already taking over by the time it was well established by the time the Ramam was around. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here's what the Ramam says. And there's a lot, I, I, I was thinking, you know, do, should we read through all of it? And the answer is yes, because seeing it in his words and seeing the subtleties of his points um, will show you like the, how seriously he takes this idea. And if I just summarized, it, I feel like I wouldn't convey that. So I'm going to have the, the text and then bullet point summaries. Okay. So if you contemplate God's actions, and by that I'm referring to the laws of nature, right, God's actions, you will gain insight into the planning and wisdom of Hashem as displayed in the creation of animals with the gradual development of the movements of their limbs and the relative positions of the latter. Likewise, you will gain insight into his wisdom and planning in the successive and gradual development of the entire condition of each particular. So then he gives an example, which I omitted, which has to do with how muscles develop, which I don't even know if it's anatomically correct anymore, so I just cut it out. But then he gives a relatable example. An example of this is the manner in which God provides for each individual animal of the class of mammals. When such an animal is born, it is extremely tender and cannot be fed with dry food. Therefore, breasts which produce milk were provided for them so that the young can be fed with moist food, which corresponds to the condition of their bodies until their limbs gradually become dry and solid. So if you try to feed a baby, you know, granola, it'll choke, right? Um, and uh, same thing with all mammals. So they're provided with nutrients in a form that is very close to their own tender, you know, constitution the milk strengthens them and then they become able to eat adult food, okay? Emphasis is on gradual development, okay? So that's point number one, is Hashem designed nature 
where all throughout nature, things develop slowly with gradual changes. And then his example is baby mammals get milk until they are stronger. Okay. I don't think we can challenge this. Like this is nature is all gradual. Okay. Like we're good with that. Okay. Now here's the, here's the, the, the Hiddish. Many commandments in our Torah are the result of a similar course adopted by the same director. That's God. For it is impossible to go suddenly from one extreme to the other. Therefore, it is impossible for man, according to human nature, to suddenly discontinue everything to which he has been accustomed. Okay. Um, so before we go, oh, so, so that's, uh, that's his premise about mitzvahs, is mitzvahs are in the same way. He doesn't want to bring humans quickly from one extreme to the other, uh, because then they would have to, they would give up uh, what they're accustomed to. And then what usually happens when you're forced to go from one extreme to another? Yeah. It doesn't last. And you just go back to your old habits, right? So uh, just get a real world example of people who try to do something like this. I was, I was hoping someone would say that, right? Is the big mistake is people flip out in seminary and make a radical change which might last for a while, but then if, since it was radical and they didn't take the time to go through the gradual changes, it doesn't last when they come back, you know, um, or they have to like try to keep it up through like some sort of like hyper, like, uh, you know, intense uh, lifestyle. Okay. So then he goes and he says uh, what, what you have learned before, which is that um, he says, now Hashem sent Moshe Rabbeinu to make the Israelites into a kingdom of priests and a holy nation through our knowledge of God, and we should devote ourselves to his service. But the universal practice in those days and the general mode of worship to which they were accustomed consisted in sacrificing animals and in doing all this pagan stuff. So that's how every religion operated. It was all based on sacrifices and offerings and stuff like that. So what's the problem? So, okay, hold on a second. So um, they brought Corbanos, fine, okay. So therefore, his wisdom and plan, as is displayed throughout the entirety of creation, did not require the discontinuation, abandonment, and abolition of all these forms of service, because this would have been contrary to the nature of man who clings to what he's accustomed. Now, this example he gives is one that some of you might be like, oh, that doesn't sound so bad. But he says, it would be in those days, it would have in those days have made the same impression as a prophet would make at the present if he called us to the service of Hashem and told us in his name that we should not pray to him, not fast, and not seek his help in times of trouble, but that we should serve him in thought alone without any actions. Which, what does that sound like? What, what uh, religious practice does that sound like of serving God alone in thought? With a, meditation, okay, right? So he's basically saying, like, if you told the religious Jew today, when you are in trouble, don't daven, just meditate. It would, it would, most, most religious Jews would, certainly in the Ramam's time when meditation was not really known, most religious Jews would, would flip out and feel like you're taking away their only way to connect to God, okay? And then what, what are they going to do? They would probably just dive in anyway. So same thing back then is if God said, stop doing korbanos, then they would feel like you're taking away the primary form of worship, and then they would seek korbanos elsewhere, and where's the only other place to get korbanos? Avodah right? So it would, they would either introduce Korbanos to Hashem anyway, or they would worse go to Avodah Zarah, okay? So that is the uh, the application to Korbanos here, okay? Is he didn't want to go against human nature. Now, yeah. Just, uh, uh, so it, the, it's a debate about how much to read into this example. You know, is the Rambam saying that it's just another example of something that would go against our nature? Or is he saying that tefillah itself in some ways is catering to human nature and the ideal thing would be to commune with God through thought alone? Because who does that, by the way, in Judaism? Who, what is the, a higher level of, of involvement with Hashem than davening that only a few people get? Nevuah, right? And that's what Nevim are doing is that they're involved in just relating to God through thought alone, you know? So... I, I think you could read it both ways. Um, and I think it's not like, there are certainly things we do in tefillah that that uh, are catering to human nature. For example, I think the fact that we verbalize tefillah, obviously God knows our thoughts. So why are we doing it? Because it's for us that by nature, we relate more to when we articulate our thoughts than when we just think them, you know, or bowing, you know, we. what's the main idea behind bowing during Shemona Israel? Yeah, acknowledge his kingship, his superiority. So a Navi could do that in his mind, but we do physical actions because we're psychological beings, you know? So I, I think you can, is that what you're asking about? Like, what is he getting at? Yeah, yeah, okay, good, good pick up there. Okay, so now he then talks about Corbanos and says, um, that's why basically God um, allowed for Corbanos, but he, he, tra he um, transferred it all to himself. So 
you only bring Kabaras in one place, space of Mikdash. You only have one tribe who's in charge, which is the Kohanim. You only have three animals that you types of animals. You know, you have to do it exactly the way that is prescribed. You, you know, you only do it at certain times. So he transferred all these types of avoda to himself uh, away from Avodah Zara. Okay, now if we pause here, you can ask a question on this whole theory. What objection do you think people have to this theory, including the Ramban? <laughs> I have a specific objection I have. It's more about the last point. Sure. Because I remember learning when we were learning in Kabar and that, like, some people said that avodas are mm -hmm. even if you would use it for its sin. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. it kind of goes against the whole idea that we all believe that avodas are was bad in and of itself. Right. Practice, not just who it's directed to. Yeah, okay, so that's, I think that's the Ramban's first objection to the Ramam. He says, you're making the table of Hashem disgusting, meaning the table of Hashem is the altar, and you're, you're basically saying, oh, we're taking these forms of Avodah Zarah and, like, using this towards Hashem. That's, like, that's a degradation of our Avodah and saying that we're introducing, like, foreign elements to Hashem. So that's a good uh, objection. Uh, I'm not going to take that up right now, but uh, there's another objection to this idea of God catering to human nature. What problem might a person raise with that? And therefore, yeah, exactly, right? Okay, yeah, good. Neither does the Ramam. Yeah, so this, let me just articulate the question in case people didn't hear. So the question is, let's see him. Oh, sorry, sorry, I skipped one step. We'll get back to that in one second. It says, through this divine plan uh, of the Korbanos, it was accomplished that the traces of Avodah Zar were wiped out, and the great true principle of our religion, the existence and oneness of Hashem, was firmly established. This result was achieved without disturbing people or making them feel strange by discontinuing the types of service to which they were accustomed, which alone were known to them. So he wiped out of Odazara without disturbing people excessively. Okay, but now he asks the question, which is, I know that you will at first thought reject this idea and find it strange. You will put the following question to me in your heart. How can we suppose that divine commandments, prohibitions, and important acts, which are fully explained and for which certain seasons are fixed, should have been commanded not for their own sake, but for the sake of some other thing, as if they were only the means by which he employed for which he employed for his primary goal. What prevented him from making his primary objective a direct commandment to us and to give us the capacity of obeying it? Those commandments, which in your opinion are only the means and not the goal, would have then been unnecessary. So the question is, how can the Ram say that Hashem went out of his way to create all these mitzvahs of Korbanos simply because he didn't want to act against human nature? God created human nature, just change it. Just just get rid of, he could have just not had all the korbanos and just made us be able to serve him. No ah, good. Okay, good. So that is the Ram's answer. Okay, but he does it in a very like, um, like bang, bang, bang way. Okay. Yeah. Why can't you just ask, like instead of asking that person, can you just ask like, if God is making us do these things that are like inherently like not, not, not in like, not valuable to Judaism. Yeah. That, isn't that like changing the value system? Which I think is like... like a okay, good question also. That's going to get into our evolutionary mor uh, morality point, uh, the next premise. Okay, yeah. so I'll, I'll try to remember to address that specific when we get there. So here's his answer. First of all, you got to love the way he introduces it. Hear my answer, which will cure your heart of this disease <laughs> and show you the truth of which I have pointed out to you. So he says, um, there occurs in the Torah a passage which contains exactly the same idea. Oh, you can use this for uh, the Seder. It is the following. So this is after Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim, but before, um, but in Parshas Peshalach, okay? Or sorry, it's not in Parshas Peshalach yet. Oh yeah, it is, it is. Very, very beginning of Peshalach. Um, so this is before they went across Yamsuf. God did not lead them by way of the land of the Pelishtim, even though it was near. For God said, lest the people change their mind when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Sea of Reeds. So Hashem, what was his concern that Bnei Israel, that would happen to Bnei Israel if they saw the Pelishtim? And, um, yeah, why, why, why were Bnei Israel prone to this? Because they were just they were, slaves in time for years. So Exactly. They were slaves. They were scared. They didn't know how to fight. So God, so it says, here Hashem led the people around, uh, away from the direct road, which he originally intended, because he was concerned that they might meet on that way with hardships too great for their ordinary strength. He took them by another road in order to obtain thereby his original goal. So before we see the Ramam spell at his point, what, what point is the Ramam making here? Exactly, right? So God was concerned that these slaves would be scared because it's human nature to be scared of war when you're slaves. And he changed his plan and took them in a roundabout way in order to avoid 
um, you know, putting a people into a position where human nature would uh, would uh, cause problems. Okay, but the wrong one goes on. He says, in the same manner, Hashem refrained from commanding what the people by their natural disposition would be incapable of obeying and gave the aforementioned commandments as a means of accomplishing his primary goal, namely knowledge of him and the rejection of Avodah Zarah. It is contrary to man's nature that he should suddenly abandon all the different kinds of divine service and the different customs in which he has been brought up and which have been so widespread that they were considered as a given. Again, back then, if I said, if I went to uh, uh, any human being on the street and said, hey, how do you worship your God? He'd say, I sacrifice. That's just obviously, what do you mean, how do I worship my God? How does anyone worship their God? In the same way, the portion of Torah under discussion is the result of divine wisdom, according to which people were allowed to continue the kind of worship to which they had been accustomed in order that they might acquire the true conviction, which is, which is the chief goal of their commandments. So this is his first answer, which is that you see that God does this, okay, in general, and this is a good example of it. But then he raises your question, Ayala, which is, you ask, what prevented Hashem from commanding us directly in that which was his primary goal, and what prevented him from giving us the capacity of obeying it? In other words, just make people able to do this. And then he gives Leah's answer, but he does it in three parts. Or sorry, uh, yeah, this was part one. Part two, this would lead to a second question. What prevented Hashem from leading the Israelites through the way of the land of Plishtim and endowing them with the strength for fighting, right? Just make them brave. This, the leading about by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, would that not have been necessary, okay? A third question would then be asked, in reference to the good promised as reward for keeping the commandments and the harm foretold as punishment for sins, it is the following question. As it is the chief goal and purpose of Hashem that we should believe in the Torah and act according to that which is written therein, why has he not given us the capacity of continually believing in it and following its guidance instead of holding out to us reward for obedience and punishment for disobedience or of actually giving all the predicted reward and punishment? For the promises and the threats are but the means of leading to this chief object. What prevented him from giving us, as part of our nature, the will to do that which he desires us to do and to abandon the kind of worship which he rejects? So what is this third question? Exactly, and therefore we wouldn't need... Uh, well, he's going to say that as part of his answer, but we wouldn't need what? He's going to say that also as part of his answer. Here, here is he saying, what is he saying you could have gotten rid of? Not Torah, reward and punishment. Right, he's saying, why does God need to like give us incentives and threats to keep Torah, right? So then he answers finally what all of you said. There's one general answer to these three questions and to all questions of the same character, and it is this. Even though all miracles involve a change in the nature of some existing thing, Hashem will never change human nature by way of a miracle. And he means a permanent change in human nature, because obviously Hashem can intervene and like, you know, let's say hardening Paro's heart, however you understand that, but he won't do it permanently. It is in accordance with this important principle that God said, okay, he quotes a Pasuk, who can assure that this heart would remain theirs to fear me and observe all my commandments all the days so that it should be good for them and their children forever. Meaning Hashem saying, who can, who can make sure that human beings will, will obey God? Well, what's the answer? You can, God. But God's saying, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna change human nature, okay? It is also for this reason that he stated distinctly the commandments and the prohibitions, the reward and the punishment. This principle as regards miracles has been frequently explained to, uh, by us in our works. I do not say this because I believe it is difficult for Hashem to change the nature of every individual person. On the contrary, it is possible and it is in his power, but it has never been his will to do it and it will never be based on the established Torah principles. Now he says what you said. For if it were his will that the nature of any human individual should be changed because of what he desires from that individual, then the sending of the prophets and the giving of the Torah would have been pointless. Right, so that's the answer. Why does God cater to human nature? Why not just change it? Because he will never permanently change human nature, just like he doesn't permanently change any natural law. And if he did it, the Torah would be pointless because then he could just say, bam, just, just be in line with my will, right? Now you can ask why God created human beings with free will, which is the same question as what is the purpose of the world? The most you can say is evidently it was his will to create a creature with free will, but we can't ask why. But what you can say is it's definitely his will to give Torah. And he, if he and the fact that he could have changed human nature to just obey Torah, but didn't means that like he's not going to go against human nature. Okay. All right. So that is the main, that is the premise that I wanted to go with is that God, the Torah works with human nature, not against it. Okay. Now, how does this help us in terms of understanding the obsolete, seemingly obsolete parts of Torah? Objective ideal, but it kind 
it works within like exactly so this leads us to our next point which is that again this is this is rabbi chaim angel's terms there's static and evolutionary evolutionary morality so here's my definition Static morality is if you look at Torah, there are certain things in Torah that reflect universal true principles of morality that are unchanging. Okay, so for example, you look at Sadaka. Sadaka shows that we take care of people who are in need. That shows what God's values actually are. And that's going to be true in all societies. Okay, Kibbut Aim, same thing, right? Is acknowledging that your parents raised you, that they brought you into existence. That's true for all time. Anti-murder, anti-theft, anti-adultery, these are all unchanging values. You look at the Haftal Recha Kamocha and you're like, oh, God wants us to love our fellow Jew the way that we love ourselves. That's universal unchanging. They have them as a ger, learning Torah, most of the Mishpatim. So those aspects of Torah you could look at and say, you can infer from here what the Torah holds is moral and immoral, and that's true for all times. But like what Elisha was just saying, evolutionary morality is that there are certain aspects of the Torah which do not reflect true moral principles but they're like stepping stones towards true morality, meaning that they were catering to human nature in order to move them from an inferior state to a, uh, an elevated state. And maybe for thousands of years, let's say like Corbanos were done for thousands of years because human beings were still at the point where they, that was their only way of worship. But you can't, according to the Rama, you can't point to Corbanos and say, oh, you see from here, God values animal sacrifice. Really, korbanos are not a sign that God values it, but that the only way to get human beings to serve him was by taking them through the roundabout way of korbanos, okay? And this is where we're going to superficially talk about some examples, okay? And I, I wanted to keep it superficial by keeping it in one bullet point and not making a slide for each one of these. Slavery, okay? So let's talk about slavery briefly. So, um, a person could point to slavery and say, oh, you see that the Torah allows for slavery, so slavery must be good. And in fact, if you look at the divrei div Torah given in shuls at the time of the Civil War in the United States, you had rabbis on both sides, those who were anti-slavery and giving their reasons. And there were pro-rabbi slavery, uh, pro-slavery pro rabbis in the South, probably, yeah. saying, like, you see, God's will is that people be enslaved because he has it in the Torah, okay? So in light of all this, what would we say about uh, about the what what how do we make sense of the Torah's inclusion of slavery? What would you say? In the Jewish world, we have the slave, and the Torah's way of doing that was to call on the path that had restrictions on that. Exactly. Okay. Good. So, just to elaborate a little bit is is I don't I don't even know. I mean, yeah, it's human nature, but in, in addition to being human nature, it was universally practiced. Every place had slaves, right? And if the Torah. And, and maybe people who know about economics can disagree with me here. But if the Torah said in that point in the ancient world, no slavery, that would be like coming around today and saying no currency. Like, just get rid of money in your society. You know, it would be a radical uprooting of the entire, an entire foundation of society. But the Torah is against slavery. Okay. How do you know the Torah is against slavery? Isaac, Isaac. <laughs> okay, right? Like yeah, exactly. We're all we're all, all slaves. You, know, you look at the way that the Torah talks about slaves, about why Jews should not be slaves, is is that we should only serve one master, which is Hashem. We, we shouldn't be uh, servants of servants, you know? So what did the Torah do? Is it took the institution of slavery, put restrictions on it about what you can and can't do to your slaves. Like, do you, do you know any, like, uh, examples of this? About, okay, oh, so right. So the, I should say the two things. There's restrictions, and then there's also, like, um, benefits. Okay, right. So, so I, I guess I should clarify also. There's two types of slavery. There's uh, Evet Ivri and Evet Knani, and there are different practices. But let's say with Evet Ivri, there's a a time limit. When you, um, if you only have one pillow, you got to give them the best one. If you only have like, you know, um, uh, you know, good food and bad food, you got to give them the good food. Okay. Um, the uh, when you set them free, you have to give them tons of money, like a generous uh, severance package. Um, uh, and even with a non-Jewish slave, I, I might have mentioned this last time. It's loud. Can you mind closing the door? Yeah, thanks. Um, I might have mentioned this last time. Um, what happens to a non-Jewish slave when they are freed? Maybe we didn't talk about this. The, not just that they could become Jewish, they automatically become Jewish. Okay, now why is that a benefit? Because we spend so much time. Because we don't have to uh, it's actually, uh, it's a good question. They, you do treat them like a gear. It's a different category of gerus.
But in other words, what happens in other societies when a slave becomes free? He can't live still. Yeah. He's still treated low. Again, America is the best example of this, unfortunately, is that when the slaves were freed, they were basically still treated as slaves and second class citizens and stuff. Here, it, it, when, when we our slave is free, they become an equal member of our society. And even the Gare point is actually good, which is that they are a Gare, which means we have to treat them even better than we treat the normal person. And objectively speaking, and you could challenge this as well, objectively speaking, we have brought them out of their, uh, you know, a Vodazara culture into a culture w which is, revolves around truth and justice and all this good stuff, you know? So you can argue like, well, how can we do that forcibly, blah, blah, blah. Um, but uh, there's also a statement that Rav Hirsch made, which I, I, I've been looking for a source for it, but uh, I have not found it other than Rav Hirsch. Rav Hirsch says that we cannot enslave anybody, okay, any non-Jews. He says Jews were only allowed to purchase people who were already on the slave market. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so therefore, it's like we are, so the Torah is allowing us to have slavery, but, in, but discouraging us from practicing it. Uh, prohibiting us from doing things that are in, inhumane. Like we can't give our slaves busy work. We can't give them overly harsh work. You know, they rest on Shabbos. Our slaves have to rest on Shabbos, which is unheard of. Slaves don't get days off anywhere else in the world. They get a day off, you know, once a week, the same as we do, we're equal to. So it, it takes that institution and instead of trying to abolish it, which would lead to a backlash, it instills it with principles of morality and humanity to the point where Ultimately, the Torah wants us to be in a world without slavery. And guess what? That's kind of where we are now. I mean, there's still slavery in some countries, but but it's, you know, it, it's trying to move humanity away from that. And that's what I mean by evolutionary morality is it starts off by saying, yeah, slavery is totally fine. We just have these restrictions, but then moves it towards, no, 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 slavery is not ideal at all, you know? Oh, okay. Are we going on the assumption that society just over time is going to evolve and become more moral? Mm. Or are there going to be new things that come up? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. I think evolutionary yeah. morality works both ways. Like that's like uh, yeah, I mean, Torah doesn't work both ways. It's already established. Right. Uh, also, we say that obviously, like, by society being like, kind of like that. It's our levels are like going down. Not also, I mean, like society as a whole, like we don't have slavery, we don't right. have like that paganism. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a hard question to answer because the I think the Torah definitely, the premise of the Torah definitely is that if we keep these mitzvahs properly, it will lead to an elimination of these immoral practices in society. But because we don't always keep these things properly, there have been eras where we've back had backsliding. We have done it, and then the world has done it also. Let's say, like in the world, the dark ages were pretty bad in terms of like the development of humanity, you know, and like and that affected the Jews also. So I think the the, the my my answer would be that the Torah is optimistic that uh, that if these are practiced, then we will be constantly moving forward. But we definitely have like you know re relapses as, as as a species. Yeah, uh, what were you going to say, Ayla? I was gonna say, how do we make a distinction? How do we know that there's security things? Too, because like from our society, yeah. You think that uh, okay. So that, that's gonna that I'm gonna address that at the end. Okay. Um, yeah. So this I got this explanation from Mrs. Fishbein. So, so the what's the problem in most societies when a woman gets raped? Obviously, it's a problem for the woman, but that's true in all societies. But no one's gonna marry them. No one's gonna marry them. They're gonna be stuck with a kid, and they're not gonna be able to support themselves because women didn't work. Right? Women couldn't like there were no jobs for women in the vast majority of human history you know, um, other than like being, you know, uh, in, the, in the home. So what the Torah is basically doing is it is ensuring that she is going to be financially provided for, guaranteed for the rest of her life, you know? Um, and so that's, that is, so the, 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 this is in the best interest of the woman as opposed to leading her to be an outcast. Um, and Mrs. Fishbein has given Shiram on this and you can ask her for There's details. Value like what value is it leading to? Like people have money. Towards her not dying. Because like, okay, she's she's gonna starve to death. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what is she supposed to do? And yeah, and it makes the man accountable, and it also deters um, this from happening because no man is gonna want. Like, if you look at at, at groups where uh, where let's say like uh, rape is prevalent, you have these men who are like just going around raping without any consequences, mm -hmm. you know. And this it, 
imposes, again, this is presuming the Jews keep this, these halachos, this imposes severe repercussions on, on the man that he has to basically take responsibility for, uh, financial responsibility for any, uh, any uh, um, you know, offspring that come from this. Why can't you just keep the home security? I mean, that already is in place, but there's a stigma that no one's going to want to, I, I don't think if you have a woman with, with kids who is never going to be able to get married, I don't think you're going to be able to say like, oh, just take charity. Like that's not, an ideal scenario, you know, like there's still so much uh, other stuff. Talk, talk to Mrs. Fishman because I feel like she would do a better job um, explaining this than I would because, uh, well, first of all, she's a woman, but also like I, I, I haven't given cheer on this particular topic. Um, uh, example, uh, again, with Kohanim. Uh, so uh, again, I forgot how often we've talked about this, but, you know, Kohanim with physical blemishes can't serve in the Mikdash, right? So a person could look at that and say, oh, you know, you're telling me God cares about how you appear? Answer is no. Okay. The answer, yeah. right? Care. People do care. So, if in general, all other areas of Torah, we don't care about physical blemishes or deformities. There's no other area in Torah where we say that, like, there are halakhic restrictions based on, on like, like unibrows and albino and, like, you know, oddly shaped uh, hands or whatever, like all, all these blemishes. Um, in fact, we make a bracha on certain types of deformities and we say, that God changes creations. And we say that this is a reflection of God's chachma. In other societies, if you had a physical deformity, what was assumed about you? Messed yeah, devil. you're messed up, the devil, you're, you're possessed, your mother was a witch, you know, you're an outcast. So none of that happens in Torah. But the question is in the Mikdash, did we talk about this example last time? I can't remember. Yeah, I feel like I'm done. yeah right. So like, 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 uh, did I give the example of like models in clothing, right? Like, so in advertising, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the clothing stores or, or clothing brands will use attractive people because they want people to buy their clothing. So what we do is we say, it'd be in an ideal world, people wouldn't care about appearance. But like I said, people do care about appearance. So what we do is just like with Corbanos, Hashem harness that and direct it towards good purpose. We say the only place we care about physical appearances is in the Mikdash, that people have to look at Kohanim and be in total awe because they're supposed to be the role models and the teachers. And it, and they're in the Mikdash, which is supposed to be a place of awe, you know? And, and therefore, if you have a physical blemish, you cannot be serving in that capacity because if we try to get people to just not care about it, that's just not gonna work, you know? So it's again, it's, it's the Torah has to walk this fine line between when does Hashem try to reform human nature and when does he cater to it in order to reform it in the long run? You know, um, yeah. Let one last example. You fast Torah. Do you guys ever learn about that? The yeah. right. Yeah. So the thing is, is <laughs> soldiers in war will rape women. That's every even today when it's against you know law, that's going to happen. So th if the Torah just said don't do this, it, they're going to violate it. So what the Torah does instead is it creates uh, severe halachic restrictions and consequences that are an attempt to either deter this practice from happening or, or, or redirect it in a way that is uh, minimal uh, damage, you know? Um, and, and if you learn, learn those halakos, then you'll, you'll see that. Okay, and there are a bunch of examples of this, okay? Oh, oh, yeah, I forgot to put the note. Each topic should be taken up in its own chair to do justice to the topic. Okay, so that's premise number six. And premise number seven, uh, I, I'm sorry we're rushing, but I, I wanna make sure that we finish this today is because of all this, then there, the Torah had planned obsolescence for a number of mitzvahs, okay? Meaning that the Torah intended for these mitzvahs to one day get to a state where they're practically not serving any function. So um, the Rambam says, I, I'm gonna just summarize this here. He says, when you have, um, there are lots of mitzvahs that we don't know the reasons for. And he says, and the reason why is because they were designed to uproot practices of Avodah Zarah, which have already disappeared. Okay, for example, peos, right? So you, you, we can't cut our peos because it was the practice of Ovdi Avodazara to grow out like their hair in certain ways, you know? Or sorry, to, to shave their peos. I got it wrong. Ovdi Avodazara would shave their peos and therefore, therefore we we don't. Now, nowadays, how many Ovdi Avodazara shave their peos? I don't even think that's a thing, right? So if you didn't know that fact, you would assume that, oh, there's no point in like this mitzvah of peos. But the Ram is saying, no, the mitzvah achieved its purpose in the sense that like that practice has disappeared. OK, um, he also says that if you uh, that uh, uh, I'm, I'm skipping here, he says any accordingly, every commandment or prohibition of the Torah whose reason is hidden from you constitutes a cure for one of those diseases, which 
today, thank God, we do not know anymore. That when you find all these missiles that you don't, these hukim that you don't know the reasons, it's because it was designed to uproot a practice which is gone, and that's why we can't relate to it anymore. So if you look at the numbers, and I, I didn't do this for all categories, but let's say Ram says there are 51 mitzvahs related to Avodah Zara, okay? If the Torah were successful in wiping out Avodah Zara, you will now have 51 mitzvahs that functionally are obsolete, meaning they're binding, but it looks like these mitzvahs are accomplishing nothing. And again, I, I asked this at the end of, of here last time, is that a sign of the Torah's imperfection or perfection? Clearly perfection, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that these mitzvahs no longer are needed is a sign of the Torah's perfection. Same thing, uh, 37 minutes was related to uh, sexual prohibitions, okay? Let's say people stopped doing incest and adultery and rape and all this other stuff, and let's say society progressed to the point where, where no one did any of those things. So now you're going to look at the mitzvahs. In fact, people say this by incest. They say, why did the Torah need to say it's us or to sleep with a sibling? That's disgusting. <laughs> why did the Torah need that? Because people did do that until, I mean, that's what happened, is, 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 is all these other societies did it, Torah prohibited it. Torah, these values got promoted through Judaism, then eventually through Christianity and through Islam, it spread throughout the world. And now incest is not something that people have a desire for as a normal desire, only as an aberration, you know? Same thing with, uh, so, so th these mitzvahs would be functionally obsolete, you know? Take all the mitzvahs, that you could go through other examples, take all the mitzvahs that have to do with theft, okay? Or with like money. If you were in a totally just society where people didn't steal, you would basically not need all those mitzvahs anymore. And that would be a good thing, you know? So there are many mitzvahs that, that if they succeed, then the mitzvahs will be functionally obsolete. Other mitzvahs will never be functionally obsolete. For example, um, like, you know, God's oneness or learning Torah. You know, you might argue people, you wouldn't need to command people to do this, but they since they reflect universal values of Torah, then then uh, it would still function to direct people towards those those things, okay? Um, so that's premise number seven. And then, sorry, I've got three minutes I got to do. I added one at the very end, an eighth premise. And people could argue that I should have put this first, but I thought that this is the this is the one point that you have heard a lot. And if I put it first, it'd be very easy for people to just dismiss the whole thing. So there's a pasuk in Devarim that says about Torah, ki lo davar reiku mikem ki hu chayechem, which means the Torah is not an empty thing for you, but really it says mikem, from you, for it is your life, okay? Yushami says, Amar of Mana, ki lo davar reku, v'im reku mikemhu. So it is not an empty thing. And if it is an empty thing, then the emptiness is from you. Why? Lama, mibnesh in atem yagim b'Torah, because you have not been involved in Torah. So the eighth premise here, which really belongs up near number one, the default assumption should be that the faults we find in the Torah result from our, or, our own shortcomings of not understanding what the Torah's intent was, and in many cases, that's the truth. And the problem is, this is a very cohesive point, is people take the values in their society and just assume that those are automatically true. And then the question is on Torah, when really, like, you should stop and say, well, maybe our society is the anomaly and messed up, and maybe the Torah is trying to direct us to realize faults in our society. Now, again, I think the examples, I've, I've tried to stick to examples where I think it, uh, it is clear, like, you know, that like, um, I think we all agree and it seems clear that slavery is bad, you know, but but this is like the first move that you should make when you see something that looks immoral or outdated in the Torah is let me make sure I actually understand this correctly. And I'm not just projecting my own societal values onto Torah and then judging Torah without questioning my own values, you know, um, because societies get stuff wrong all the time. Like, slavery, you know, like, like, uh, you know, uh, again, there's so many instances where it looks like the Torah is being immoral, when really, your society is so messed up that you view immorality as morality and vice versa. And like, you know, you should not be so quick to like condemn Torah and say, Oh, this is outdated, you know, you should, you should uh, at least do your research and make sure that this is a uh, sound. What about yeah. What about Durbans? So Durbans are slightly different because there you are dealing with human uh, fallibility, you know, and, and and partial knowledge. So it is it is much <laughs> easier, I guess that is the wrong word. It, 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 you have much more grounds for saying that the Rabbanan made a an uh, a, an error or that they missed something in in their instituting of a Durbanan than you have for the Torah. Because the Torah is created by the one who created human beings, whereas the, the Rabbanan were just doing the best that they could with the tools that they had. There were questions I said I would return to. I don't, one from you, one from you. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Obsolescence, yeah. Um, why not get rid of every mint spell once it becomes obsolete? Like, for example, if if someone has a problem of, like, stealing, and yeah. then they go to Baiton, and Baiton says, like, okay, you have to pay this person back. Yeah. Or, like, in rea- like people do community service or whatever until they feel like they've gone over their, like, <laughs> problem yeah yeah so that really relates to two points one is point number one here about the torah can like can't be tampered with um but there's also a slip a real slippery slope of if the torah were if the mitzvahs of the torah were not permanent and there was this underlying assumption that you could do away with things when they weren't relevant so then it's very easy to just start chipping away from torah because this is exactly what happened with reform judaism is they said any mitzvah that we don't view as relevant, we're just going to take away, and then eventually the whole thing falls apart. You know, so it's 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 a danger to the system, but it's also God created a Torah, and just like the laws of nature can't change, then he that's how he had he he creates Torah is that it's an unchanging thing. Well, I wouldn't do it. They won't come back. that won't come back. Yeah. Oh, that's the other point. That's another good point is that that you never know when these things will come back, and so therefore that's keeping true. these mitzvahs there, even if just for the idea that that let's say like all these avodah czar practices that are gone the idea that people used to do this and that satisfies some sort of psychological need and that it's a harmful psychological need the existence of that mitzvah there reminds us of that idea and prevents us from like giving into those uh psychological forces but could um could it having uh, I want to say, I, I should just say uh, she is over officially so if you have to go then uh have a good chavez uh yeah leah okay, so could it like having it there I I hear what you're saying. Like, like the, um, like people say this about Trump right now is that, uh, (laughs) is that like, like that he was taken off of all the, of of like Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. So like if, if people who want him to go away should stop like taking screenshots and like, like talking about him in the news and stuff like that, you know, like the fact that you keep on bringing him up means that he's going to be part of the conversation. And so you're saying, could that happen with mitzvahs and stuff? That the fact that we keep on bringing these things up, you know, yeah. I think it does happen too. Like people have like, these, like superstitious type of things. Yeah. Are like outgrowths of like certain. certain right. Like, right. Um, yeah. Here's an example. Right. Is that you know you have machlokas whether the magic whether magic is real or not. Right. You know. So the Ram says that magic is all fake. But you have people who still will look in the Torah, and see and say, well, if it's if magic is fake why the Torah prohibit it? Or like, how come the Torah talks about the Egyptian uh, sorcerers? And and that will be an anchor for them to be rooted in these false beliefs. Yeah, yeah. It's, a good, it's a good question. I guess it's it's, a, it's either a risk that Hashem was willing to take um, or, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, it's the lesser of two evils, you know, like to, um, to campaign against something, you're going to risk keeping that topic around and making people realize it's an option, you know, but you're, since you're campaigning against it, if the campaign is good enough, then it will minimize cases where that comes back, you know, like imagine talking about like, let's say like, um, you know, like uh, domestic, you know, uh, like, uh, like abuse and like pedophilia and all this other stuff. Yeah. The fact that people talk about it might lead people to like, Discover it. discover it and explore this thing, you know, but I think no one would argue that we should stop talking about it. Like it's, you know, we're talking about it so that we can, you know, stamp it out. Yeah. 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 Uh, Naomi, you had a question? No, oh, I just, I wanted to say that I heard um, an explanation about what the Torah from Rabbi Zimmer, who uh, thought maybe the Torah didn't, um, uh, uh, didn't talk, didn't say that uh, magic, the, the magic stuff was false because, you know, uh, people would see like they'd be tricked thinking that it was true and then if right. they thought it was true it would be a challenge they wouldn't believe right. the Torah. It was like this yeah thing. meaning if the Torah just didn't talk about it then people would be like oh the Torah didn't talk about it you know and and this thing okay. is real. you know and then that, that would allow it to be more of a threat yeah it's a good point yeah, or, 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 or like uh, people would say okay well i i believe it in magic i believe it's true because they would be tricked by magicians and then they would yeah. say okay the Torah must be false yeah right that's a good point okay have a good job. This, and again, this is a, the beginning of a conversation. You know, obviously, we have to talk about each of the particulars if we wanted to go in. Uh, okay. Thank you.